A warm welcome and thank you for joining the Winning Paths podcast family. We wanted to take a moment to express our sincere gratitude for your unwavering support and enthusiasm for the Winning Paths podcast. Your subscription means the world to us, and we're thrilled to have you on this archery journey with us. At Winning Paths, which is a part of TFAM, the Irish Field Archery Monthly, we are not just another audio channel, but a community of passionate archery enthusiasts brought together by our shared love for this ancient and captivating sport. Whether you're a seasoned archer or just starting, our podcast is designed to cater to your interests. Explore the depths of archery's rich history with our insightful monologues that delve into fascinating historical topics. From ancient archers to modern day legends, we aim to provide you with a well-rounded understanding of the sport's evolution. Our interviews feature unique figures in the archery community, sharing their experiences, insights, and invaluable advice. Additionally, our hosts are not afraid to express interesting and sometimes controversial opinions, sparking thoughtful discussions within our community. Expect book and gear reviews that help you stay updated on the latest trends and advancements. We also bring you interesting and lesser known facts about archery, ensuring that every episode is a treasure trove of information for our subscribers. If you're enjoying the Winning Paths podcast, why not spread the word? Encourage your fellow archery enthusiasts to join our growing community. Together, we can create a hub for all things archery a place where passion meets knowledge and every arrow finds its winning path. Why not to become a Winning Paths patron, premium subscriber? Your support not only enhances your own archery experience, but also helps us continue delivering high quality content for the entire Winning Paths community. By aiding us in such a way, you're not just gaining access to exclusive content, you're becoming a crucial part of the inner circle, supporting the growth and sustainability of the podcast you love. Thank you once again for being a part of the Winning Paths family. Your subscription fuels our passion, and we're excited to continue delivering engaging content that resonates with the archery community. Subscribe, share, and let's continue shooting for the stars together. Salutations, fellow temporal wanderers and digital voyagers. I'm Marcin, your curious comrade on this intellectual sojourn through the legendary thickets of Sherwood Forest. Join me on the Winning Paths podcast, where we blend the whimsy of a court jester with the analytical prowess of a medieval alchemist in our quest to unravel the scientific intricacies of Robin Hood. Now, you may ponder, why Robin Hood and why the scientific twist? Well, dear listeners, if Galileo had traded his telescope for a longbow, or if Newton had pondered the laws of motion while donning green tights, they might have outpaced me. Yet, the honor is mine to decode the mysteries of the legendary Robin Hood. In our episodes, we'll dive into the mathematical precision of Robin's arrow trajectory, exploring whether his mid-air acrobatics were more physics or the whimsy of medieval enchantment. Spoiler alert, it's a dash of both, with a sprinkle of time travel paradoxes for good measure. But that's not the whole tale. Join me as we decipher the algorithm behind Marion's champion-choosing escapade. Love, it seems, follows a path that's a medieval maze of mystery, yet oddly logical. As we traverse the forest of folklore, anticipate not only historical revelations, but also a hearty dose of medieval banter. Envision me as your friendly jester, seamlessly weaving past and present with the comedic flair of someone who just unearthed a treasure trove of medieval memes. So, set your temporal compasses as we journey into the whimsical realm where Robin Hood meets the scientific method. Winning Paths isn't merely a podcast, it's a time-traveling adventure, seasoned with more laughs than a jester's convention, and punctuated with lessons learned through the ages. As we uncover the secrets of Robin's quiver, we're not just unraveling history, we're peering through the temporal mists, gleaning lessons from the past, that resonate with the archers of today. This is Winning Paths, where I, Marcin, play the role of your Sherwood Sherpa, guiding you through the enchanted forest of science and satire, and reminding you that every arrow released echoes through the corridors of time, leaving behind lessons for modern archers to heed. Let our quest through history commence. In the complex interweaving of history, myth, and folklore, the echoes of Robin Hood's legend traverse a diverse array of narratives, 
The romances chronicling the lives of historical figures, Herewood, displaced in the 11th century, Eustace the Monk, spanning from 1100 to 1217, Fulk Fitzwarren, from the late 12th century to 1256, William Wallace, existing from 1270 to 1305, and Robert the Bruce, reigning from 1274 to 1329, predate the written sagas of the renowned outlaw, imprinting an indelible mark on the unfolding narrative. Notably, the complexity of the tale is augmented by Robert the Bruce's claim to the earldom of Huntingdon, meticulously explored by Bradbury in the year 2010. Embarking on a perilous odyssey, Hereward, a veritable Saxon noble, unjustly dispossessed of his rightful lands, sought to reclaim his heritage from a malevolent Norman sovereign. His saga unfolds as he, with cunning ingenuity, assumes the guise of a potter to infiltrate the enemy's camp, confronts betrayal by ecclesiastics, seeks sanctuary amidst the verdant expanses of Rockingham Forest, North Ants, and ultimately achieves reconciliation with the very monarch from whom redress was sought. Intriguingly, within the same effort, another incarnation of Robin Hood faces imprisonment in the year 1354 for exploits within the selfsame forest. Amidst the 13th century, several individuals bearing the name Robin, Robert, Hood, Hude, Hode, Hod, or being surnamed Robin Hood, existed, yet none emerges as a definitive prototype for the legendary outlaw. The plausible existence of an authentic figure is suggested, though his contribution may extend little beyond nomenclature and a singular outlawed exploit. The name itself had already acquired usage as a designation for felons during that era. Parallel tales of outlawry, exemplified by Gamelin in the 14th century and Adam Bell in the 16th century, alongside narratives from Scandinavia, traverse analogous trajectories, sharing motifs with the enduring legend of Robin Hood. The origins of Friar Tuck and Little John likely find their roots, at least partially, in these alternate outlaw sagas. Additionally, the early 14th century Anglo-Norman French Song of Trailbaston unveils a green wood of justice featuring archery and outlaws referred to as hoods. Despite the stark realities of outlaw life, where the imperatives of ruthlessness often prevail, some among their ranks garner sympathy from the peasantry owing to their perceived opposition to unscrupulous royal officials, as elucidated by Baldwin in the year 2011. Within the temporal expanse of the 12th to 14th centuries, the ballads narrating the exploits of Robin Hood, a yeoman or forester outlawed, unfold. Despite their assured circulation in the 14th century, as noted in William Langland's Piers Plowman, 1377, these tales eluded the written word until the 15th century. Not until approximately 1500 do the earliest extant versions materialize, illuminating the historical anachronisms that permeated the initial printed renditions during the 17th century. A veritable wellspring of the Robin Hood legend lies within the abundant reservoir of popular plays and games from the 15th and 16th centuries, intricately interwoven into the expansive canvas of Spring May or Whitsun festivities, the harbinger of summer. Within these joyous celebrations, the French pastoral Robin, distinct in origin, traversed the channel with his Marion, melding seamlessly with the English outlaw. This convergence gave rise to a multifaceted Robin, the summer king and lord of misrule. The latter, undoubtedly influenced by tales of the mischievous sprite Robin Goodfellow, embodied a spirit of merriment, allowing for a modicum of licentiousness within societal structures. Yet, as an ephemeral figure, Robin remained fated for ultimate defeat symbolized by his consistent losses in matches against other combatants. Upon the village green, where the resonance of revelry interwove with the dance of Maid Marian and a comedic friar, a metamorphosis unfolded, a fusion of tales that endowed upon the outlaw, Frere Tuck, a role in the fabric of the Robin Hood universe. Nevertheless, Tuck's presence did not crystallize within the narratives until the 19th century, meticulously woven into the legend by the novel Ivanhoe. In contrast, Maid Marian, undergoing her own narrative evolution, firmly entrenched herself in the literary legend during the 16th century, catalyzed by the Reformation. 
in a recalibration of Robin's affiliations, severed from devotion to the Virgin Mary, made Marian emerged as his steadfast companion. As the 16th century unfolded, the Robin Hood games that once graced the village green gracefully relinquished their dominion to the burgeoning Morris dancing tradition, wherein Marian seamlessly transitioned into the role of the man-woman figure in the Morris. Imbued prominently within the tales, archery surfaced as a vital element of the festivities, capturing the favor of feudal overlords for nurturing a skill integral to warfare. Amidst the revelry, suspicions arose concerning other facets of the celebrations. In 1549, Bishop Hugh Latimer voiced his discontent as he observed people forsaking the church in favor of the Robin Hood games and fairs, dismissing the legendary figure as a traitor and a thief. In the shifting currents of the Elizabethan era, the rise of London-based plays, coupled with the dissemination of printed ballads, marked a significant pivot in the narrative focus of the Robin Hood legend. This transformation gained prominence, particularly in the mid-17th century, when Puritan suppression stifled traditional games. Theatre, characterized by resilience and allure for the burgeoning middle class, became a beacon of continuity. In the theatrical panorama of 1600, Anthony Munday unfolded the character of Robin, casting him as the dispossessed Earl of Huntingdon a rebel against unjust authority. Marion assumed the role of his love interest while Prince John emerged as the arch-villain. During Monday's era, the historical Earl of Huntingdon was Henry Hastings, a scion of Bruce descent once considered a potential successor to Queen Elizabeth. The 19th century ushered in the era of the novel and Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe propelled the Robin Hood legend to unprecedented heights. Firmly entrenched in Saxon identity, Robin Hood emerged as a resolute adversary against the oppressive Normans existing within the era of Kings Richard and John, a deviation from the erstwhile unspecified Edward or Henry. Anachronism, a recurrent motif in Robin Hood's narrative, underwent a metamorphosis as Robin transitioned from robbing the undeserving and aiding the underdog to the philanthropic act of robbing the rich to benefit the poor. Guy of Gisborne, once relegated to a minor role in the ballad Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne, assumed a starring role, imparting a new dimension to the evolving narrative. In the wake of Robin Hood's widespread acclaim, a sequence of historical figures seamlessly intertwines with analogous narratives. A noteworthy account centers around Robert Kett, eloquently chronicled by Hoare in the year 1989. In 1549, coinciding with the fervent castigation of Robin Hood plays by Bishop Latimer, Kett orchestrated a march upon Norwich, then England's second city. This endeavor blossomed into a formidable rebellion, resonating with a fervent cry for justice. Beyond the city's confines, on the verdant expanse of Mousehold Heath, and amidst the venerable Thorpe Woods, the rebels established their camp. However, the narrative took a somber turn as they faced ultimate defeat in a pitched battle orchestrated by the Earl of Warwick. Kett, standing as the emblematic figurehead, met his demise on the executioner's block, branded a traitor. This poignant plea for justice set against the backdrop of a realm entangled in fractured governance with a sickly boy, Edward VI, ascending the throne and the Duke of Norfolk, confined to the tower, played a pivotal role. From the recesses of woods and wastelands beyond the city, this fervent call rippled through time, instrumental in the inception of the initial national poor law. From the fervent plea of Kett, the genesis of transformative legislation unfolded. Crafted by the visionary John Aldrich, the levy of a poor rate became the embodiment of this new societal contract. Stirred by the echoes of justice from Kett's camp, Archbishop Matthew Parker approached Aldrich to sculpt a national scheme. The reverberations of this historic moment underscored the profound impact of those who emerged from the fringes shaping the trajectory of governance and societal responsibility. Embarking on a temporal journey to the 1990s, the contemporary narrative introduces the eco-warrior known as Swampy, whose real name, Daniel Hooper, conjures a modern defiance akin to Robin Hood's spirit. The press, reminiscent of the balladeers of old, portrayed his clashes with the authorities as a contemporary rendition of Robin Hood versus the sheriff. Swampy, 
along with a legion of kindred spirits, adopted the trees and tunnels as their modern-day Sherwood Forest, barricading against the imposition of unpopular road schemes. This modern-day saga, intricately woven into the rich history of defiance, illustrates the enduring allure of the Robin Hood motif, adapting seamlessly to contemporary struggles for justice and environmental stewardship. During the Victorian age, enthusiasts embarked on a quest for the mythical origins of Robin Hood, marking a significant paradigm shift. Embracing romantic ideals, this era interwove notions of a universal Neolithic great goddess and medieval and early modern witches into the cultural narrative. A pivotal moment in this exploration occurred with the 1931 release of Margaret Murray's seminal work, The God of the Witches. Within its pages, the great mother goddess yielded precedence to the horned god, allegedly venerated since the Paleolithic era, albeit on precarious evidence. Horned figures, whether deities or ambiguous entities from diverse cultures like Chernunos or Herne, were amalgamated into the archetype of the devil presiding over alleged witch covens, Hutton, 1993, 1996, 1999. Intriguingly, Robin Hood found a place among these figures. Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor stands as our earliest glimpse into Herne, Hart, 1996, a huntsman who roams near an oak tree with great ragged horns. Yet, the ambiguity persists. Is it the man or the tree adorned with horns? This woodland scene unfolds in Windsor Great Park, home to a significant heronry. A subtle revelation emerges. Herne etymologically linked to Heron, the apparently one-legged bird associated with the wounded King of Grail legend. While Murray's arguments faced refutation, her work held significance in inspiring elements of modern pagan witchcraft. It carved a niche within the popular perception of Robin Hood, and notably, it served as a muse for Richard Carpenter's 1980s TV series, Robin of Sherwood. This televised rendition rewove the narrative of Robin Hood, infusing it with resilient paganism thriving within the forest. Here, the horned god manifested in the form of Herner the Hunter, acting as an intermediary through a mysterious shaman. The bow, an emblematic symbol of polarity, resonates as the cornerstone of magic. Modern pagan witchcraft exemplifies this through gender polarity, particularly evident in Wicca, and light-dark polarity, prevalent in traditional witchcraft. In the realm of Robin of Sherwood, Herney imparts to Robin, the powers of light and dark are strong in you. Contrary to the conventional narrative depicting Marion as a passive figure, contended for by indifferent men, it is she who, in reality, exercises agency in selecting her champion. The crux of the matter lies in the feminine principle asserting itself, claiming the right to rule. Both Marion and Guinevere exercise choice, they are not compelled, the champions, perceived as distinct entities, actually represent dual aspects of the same character, undergoing metamorphosis with the turning of the year. The subtitle, derived from the Doctor Who tale, Robot of Sherwood, succinctly encapsulates this idea. In the narrative, it is the Doctor's companion, Clara, embodying the Marian force, who is astutely recognized as the real ringleader by an attentive guard all while the Doctor and Robin engage in discord within a dungeon. The dichotomy between the Summer King and Winter King emerges as a facet of the broader mythology surrounding twin brothers, potentially observable across cultures globally. This expansive light-dark, good king-bad king polarity manifests itself in the concept of the wounded kingship. Interestingly, in the context of Robin Hood, the archetypal split kingship materializes in the Richard John dichotomy. While Richard is traditionally perceived as the virtuous, rightful king, in reality, he employed the country's resources for a distant war, remaining largely absent. On the other hand, by the standards of the time, John proved to be a more competent ruler. The ambiguity surrounding the characterization of the good and bad king underscores the significance of maintaining equilibrium rather than one's triumph over the other. Robin, Emerging as the challenger from the Greenwood, harbors no aspirations of ascending to kingship beyond his domain. Instead, he aspires to serve the just, complete, and healed king. With the restoration of equilibrium, 
the intrinsic creative polarity can resume its transformative work, healing the wasteland and fostering the flourishing of the land. This perspective does not dismiss a seasonal interpretation. Robin assumes the role of the Lord of the Summer Green Woods. As autumn descends, he transforms into the horned hunter, Hearn, the one-legged guardian of the murky mere, the Fisher King, also synonymous with the Wounded King. His wound signifies the separation from his Marion, who, in turn, assumes the role of the Dark Lady of Winter, Abbess of Kirklees. Yet, with her rejuvenation in spring, reflective of the creative tensions inherent in that season, and mirrored in the hunter's bow, Robin is revitalized. While the expansive interpretation of the subject and the subsequent departure from the canonical narrative of the legend, assuming the existence of such a legend, might appear problematic, it is imperative to revisit the origins and scrutinize the employment of the longbow by our protagonist. Within the vast panorama of medieval literature, Robin Hood emerges as an emblematic figure, his essence eloquently unraveling through the agency of his weapon. It is noteworthy that the exploration of Robin Hood's proficiency in archery represents a relatively unexplored domain, a scholarly void that recent academic endeavors have begun to address, correlating the evolution of his weaponry with the chronology of early ballads and the guest. Hence, the proposition to examine the archery contests depicted in the earliest narratives as deliberate mechanisms employed to facilitate the re-establishment of outlaw justice. Advancing these analytical perspectives, we venture to investigate the intricate interplay between archery and the protagonist's socio-economic elevation and refinement, as illustrated in the initial Robin Hood poems, Robin Hood and the Monk, Robin Hood and the Potter, Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne, and the enduring little guest of Robin Hood. Within this diverse spectrum of literary exploration, the resonance of Robin Hood's longbow, serving both as a tangible weapon and a figurative motif, crafts a captivating narrative that transcends the boundaries of time. At the outset, the association between archery and the pursuit of gentility may appear discordant. The longbow, often overshadowed by the romanticized ideals of chivalry, did not align with the nobler virtues esteemed by the nascent English social hierarchy. Contrary to weapons designed for close quarters and ceremonial combat, the longbow's recognition was primarily confined to the yeoman class in the 14th century, a distinction earned through its efficacy in English military victories. Bereft of the decorative potential inherent in metal weapons and the broader surfaces of the crossbow conducive to ornamental display, the longbow did not lend itself to the ostentatious exhibition of status within material culture. Furthermore, Documentary evidence pertaining to the societal perception of non-military archery in England from the 14th to the 18th centuries remains markedly sparse, particularly in comparison to its continental European counterparts. These factors may have previously deterred scholars from exploring the social implications of English archery. Nevertheless, scrutinizing archery as a status activity within the emergent European societal class aims to draw tentative yet potentially insightful parallels regarding its standing in England, particularly its interplay with Robin's preoccupations with gentility, notably evident in the guest. To unravel the role of archery in the late medieval Robin Hood poems, evidence will be gleaned from both English and continental sources, ranging from literary works to visual representations such as depictions of the squire's yeoman, manuscript miniatures, confraternity badges, chronicles, and records of shooters' associations, predominantly Netherlandish. While caution must be exercised in generalizing from such divergent geographical, typological, urban, and temporal contexts, these varied witnesses provide valuable insights into the status-granting nature of archery in the early Robin Hood poems. Social organizations of archers emerge as promising arenas to explore the intersection of archery and class mobility. The formation of groups, akin to guilds, in new continental urban societies served as militias employing crossbows and longbows for local defense, offering a window into the practice and social dynamics of archery within these evolving communities. To garner renown, the members engaged in inter-urban shooting competitions, reminiscent of those chronicled in Robin Hood and the Potter and the Guest, yet on a grander and meticulously orchestrated scale. 
It is plausible to infer that English archers' confraternities mirrored the evolution of their counterparts in France, Germany, and the Low Countries. With patron saints and a membership drawn from the ranks of modest merchants and artisans, these fraternities likely reflected the edicts of the Statute of Winchester in 1367, mandating proficiency in crossbow or longbow for every Englishman. Despite the scarcity of direct evidence, a measure of indirect substantiation persists. The existence of archers' competitions akin to continental traditions in England is intimated in John Stowe's Survey of London. Describing the practice ground, Taswell, where the guild of crossbow makers aimed at the popinjay, or wooden bird, mounted on a distant archer's butt, Stowe's account resonates with the challenging backdrops depicted in the guest. When they came to Nottingham, the butts were fair and long, many was the bold archer that shot with bows strong. Even in the 18th century, Salisbury featured archery butts for competition and practice, and today, a modern housing development between the city and Stonehenge bears the evocative and refined name of Archer's Gate. The perception of England as late as 1486, through continental eyes, as a realm steeped in such competitions and collective longbow proficiency, is vividly conveyed in an illustration by the French miniaturist Robinet Testard. Adorning a geographical treatise made for Louise de Savoie, the illustration presents two contrasting confraternities in livery engaging in longbow contests at the butts. Tested's portrayal suggests a perception of Englishmen in his era as skilled and fixated longbow practitioners, even though the actual French text from the 1370s, which he is illustrating, makes no mention of Englishmen and the longbow. These artisans of London, bound together in the craft of bowmaking, mirrored precisely the societal and martial conduct of their continental archer counterparts. The act of aiming at the popinjay, a wooden bird mounted on a pole, in public competition several times a year, was mandated by the regulations of Netherlandish longbow and crossbow confraternities. Such gatherings proved immensely popular across all social strata. The triumphant archer, who successfully dislodged the bird from its perch, earned the coveted title of king for a year. This monarch was duly followed by the other confraternity members, bestowing upon him a suit of clothes, wine, and other symbols of civic status. Should he achieve this feat for three consecutive years, he ascended to the grandeur of emperor, oftentimes being granted hereditary nobility. These mobile trophies, such as the elaborate gilt collars adorned with bow and arrow motifs worn by the kings, echoed the opulent collars of aristocratic orders. A striking parallel is drawn with the silver-shafted arrow crowned with gold feathers and a broad head that Robin secured in the competition orchestrated by the Sheriff of Nottingham in the guest. The competitions were not only arenas for skill, but also opportunities for social elevation, as revealed by medieval manuscript miniatures depicting them. The silver arrow, a tangible token, evokes the status conferencing ceremonial prizes offered in such contests. One of the interurban shooting competitions held in Ghent in 1371 saw the presence of John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, a patron of Chaucer. It is plausible to assume that such events were frequented by other middle and upper class Englishmen. The Flemish realists, in their magnificent urban scenes, provide compelling visual evidence of how archery confraternities and their competitions facilitated upward mobility in the material culture of the late Middle Ages. Among the depictions are scenes of crossbow practice featuring guests of the crossbow, men's St. George Guild, individuals ascending the social ladder. Simon Benning's Hennessy Hours of circa 1530 captures the rituals, festivities, and competitions of these groups, integral components of what Walter Prevenier and Wim Blockman's term the Burgundian theater state. This involved the symbolic display of wealth and material magnificence. Registers of members attest to the diversity within these confraternities, encompassing citizens from the urban merchant and artisan class, a stratum that scholars like Thomas H. Olgren have associated with the yeomen of the Robin Hood poems. Participation in these groups offered esteemed marks of status, granting the privilege of donning livery, carrying distinctive banners, bearing weapons in public, 
practicing in communal spaces and possessing meeting houses, chapels, and hospitals adjacent to their shooting grounds in fashionable quarters of the city. In his scrutiny of charters within the realms of ritual, Peter Arnaid deduces, particularly for Gent, an awareness among confraternity brothers of the world of aristocratic chivalry. This is evident from the document's emphasis on refined behavior and armed grace. Despite surviving membership lists revealing the inclusion of artisans and merchants, the Dutch St. George Guild's records from 1454 in The Hague indicate that only 25% of the militia comprised nobles and civil servants, while the majority hailed from the ranks of ordinary citizens. Venturing into the Benning scene of archery practice unveils the nuanced interplay of social hierarchy. A crossbowman, adorned in the distinct livery of the Bruges St. George confraternity, stands poised in a broad-shouldered, heavily pleated knee-length robe. This figure, adorned diagonally in patterned blue and red, prepares to shoot at a substantial target on a butt. Concurrently, a diligent servant crank-cocks another bow, while liveried confraternity members in the background stand ready with their crossbows. A line of citizens, devoid of the confraternity's livery, awaits their turn to shoot, embodying city fathers, aldermen, guildmasters, and the like. These dignitaries, often invited to competitions by the archers, offer a living testament to social fluidity and the display of material culture within the shooters' confraternities. Arranged by social importance, their attire progressively diminishes in splendor, echoing the dynamic opportunities for ostentation among the archers. Thus, these explorations are focusing on organized societies of crossbowmen dedicated to St. George. Conversely, archers' societies devoted to St. Sebastian unveil a narrative for ordinary villagers and townsfolk. Their social and civic functions, akin to the shooting matches in the early Robin Hood poems, paint a different picture. Consider the present-day St. Sebastian Guild Hall in Brugge, a state monument erected in 1562. This hall, perched on the site of an earlier building, boasts a defensive tower overlooking the city walls, adjacent to a shooting practice field, now transformed into a quaint park area with a windmill. Within the active guild's meeting hall, portraits of the saint and archives dating back to the 18th century foundation bear witness to its historical significance. Not far off, the opulent crossbowman's guild of St. Joris in Bruges retains the Popinjay pole within its grounds, marking a distinct difference in the social hierarchy. A scene captured in a calendar miniature from Paris, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, MS Lat. 1872 provides a vivid illustration of archers' competitions for the month of May. Longbowmen, shooting at the Popinjay, are surrounded by onlookers, including children and spouses. A liveried member proudly carries the group's banners, while others engage in musical performances. The emphasis on sumptuous attire, musical spectacle, and the adoration of spectators hints that even longbow archery was, at times, an elite pursuit. Archery transcends mere skill. It becomes an occasion for ostentatious displays of material culture and political power. Crossbowmen's confraternities, as previously illuminated, showcased rich costumes during parades and competitions, integral to their prowess. Royal entries offered longbow archers a platform for extravagant displays. In 1449, Charles VII's entry into Rouen witnessed a personal retinue of 106 archers, outshining all others. These archers, adorned in vermilion, white, and green, sleeveless coat armor, laden with gold embellishments, presented an emblem of the king's imperious power, accentuating the unique cachet of the longbow. These illuminations and contemporary descriptions underscore the role of archery as a nexus for social ascent and ostentatious display during the era of the early Robin Hood poems. Further down the social spectrum, English lead and tin badges emerge as heralds of group identities integral to late medieval life. These badges, seemingly emblematic of fraternal associations of longbowmen, offer glimpses into the societal identities of the time. Unearthed badges featuring archers with longbows from the Thames foreshore suggest membership in archers' confraternities. These enigmatic artifacts, posited by Thomas H. Olgren, as linked to upwardly mobile guildsmen and yeomen, 
add another layer to our understanding. Olgren's argument, centered on the guest, underscores the incongruity between Robin's yeoman status and his adherence to knightly customs, appealing to the urban merchant and artisan classes who are both producers and consumers of the Robin Hood poems. In the serene parish of Thorpe, nestled about three miles north of Ashbourne in Derbyshire's Peak District, the timeless echoes of archery resonate in the annals of St. Leonard's Church. Lintels, bearing the sharpening mark since the 1460s, stand as witnesses to a bygone era when Sunday afternoons, under the reign of Edward III, transformed the southern embrace of the church into a sanctuary for archery practice. Parishes, acting upon royal edict, housed a bounty of bows and arrows within the sacred walls, ensuring even those of modest means could partake in this noble art. Remarkably, not only did the church provide the arrows, but it also extended the means to sharpen them, a unique confluence of sacred and practical. With this historical tableau etched in our minds, the early Robin Hood poems beckon our attention, where archery unfurls its multifaceted narrative, weaving together the practical and the status revealing. In the practical realm, archery asserts its dominance through the art of war, the pursuit of game, and the spirited competitions that showcase Robin's unparalleled prowess, becoming a vital narrative thread. Yet archery's evolution transcends utility, ascending to a coveted realm in the material culture of the period. The bow, once a mere utilitarian tool, metamorphoses into an object de luxe, intricately tied to Robin's ascension into gentility through his dealings with the esteemed Sir Richard at Lee. Stephen Knight's observation, casting swords as the primary instruments of fighting in ballads and guest, somewhat belies the profound presence of bows in combat. The guest, a literary work of art itself, reveals the potency of bows as much dispatches a monk, an arrow wounds little John, and Robin's men deploy bows to fight off the sheriff of Nottingham's henchmen. Furthermore, in the intricate dance of combat, Robin Hood, true to his legendary skill, dispatches the sheriff with an arrow, reserving the sword for the final coup de grace. Yet, the symbolic and status-conferring significance of archery, a more subtle dance, unfolds in the folds of the narrative. Within Guest's rich narrative, archery threads its way through Robin's wistful yearning for a golden age, a time when the hunt, ruled by natural law, reigned supreme. Archery becomes a mnemonic aid, a beckoning call to his true home, the forest. Even as the king extends an invitation into the courtly realm, Robin accepts with the stipulation that should the court fail to charm him, he shall return to the pursuit of the dun deer. After a sojourn of fifteen months in court, realization dawns upon Robin. His wealth-depleted memories of his prowess as an archer flicker back to life at the sight of young men engaged in shooting. The forest calls him home, a sanctuary where he rekindles his Golden Age identity through archery, culminating in the noble slaying of a majestic stag. In the second fit of the guest, a subtle tableau unfolds, reminiscent of a Franklin's tale-like competition, revealing the moral and spiritual parity between Robin and the knight Sir Richard. In a symbolic display of gentility, Sir Richard orders a hundred bows, meticulously strung and adorned with arrows of sublime craftsmanship. Peacock feathered and burnished heads gleaming, these arrows, both ornamental and potent, bear witness to a world where aesthetics merge seamlessly with martial prowess. As Robin questions the purpose of these bows and feathered arrows, the narrative subtly unravels the complex layers of symbolism and status they hold, weaving a rich narrative where archery becomes not just an art, but a symbol, a conduit for the pursuit of nobility and the echoing call of the forest, a sanctuary of timeless tales. Within Chaucer's lyrical panorama, the squire's yeoman emerges, adorned with a sheaf of peacock-feathered arrows, bright and keen, under his belt, he barful brittily. These arrows, more emblematic than utilitarian, serve as proclamations of distinction, drawing focus to the squire as a figure elevated beyond the common yeoman archers. Chaucer, with meticulous strokes, crafts a niche for the squire, emphasizing not only practical prowess, but a distinct social identity. The squire, it seems, takes profound pride in his equipment, transforming it into a visual ode to his social standing, 
a subtler overture for favorable social engagements. In a literary pas de deux echoing an earlier association, Richard Pinson, discerning the affinity between the squire's yeoman and Robin Hood, immortalizes this kinship. He employs the yeoman's woodcut portrait from his edition of the Canterbury Tales for the title page when printing A Little Geste of Robin Hood in 1496. Bundles of arrows, emblematic motifs in the iconography of both men, weave a visual symphony connecting their narratives. Venturing into the social milieu of London wills, a fascinating resonance emerges with archery gear as a prized legacy. Richard Yonger, a London brewer in 1413, bequeathed his executors a gold bow, while John Rogertson, a Londoner of unspecified trade in 1419 to 1420, left behind a legacy comprising a pair of sheets, a dagger, and a bow without repeated, a bow without lamination. These artifacts, bequeathed with care, speak of a society where archery was not just a pastime, but an integral part of one's identity. Transcending the bounds of London, echoes of the squire's yeoman's peacock-feathered arrows resonate in wills from the geographical realm of the Robin Hood poems. Within this realm, inhabited by what Du Boulay termed upward strivers, the legacies intertwine with the upward trajectory of those seeking advancement. A 1490 will, penned by the prosperous York tailor Peter Balberg, details a gift of Viginti tres sagitas plumets cum pavon alongside otter furs, underlining the fusion of practical and ornamental elements, while York Skinner, Thomas Hirste, leaves behind Arcum meum cum le grain bat et septem sagitas paco pederde. These testaments hint at ceremonial archery, possibly entwined with guild or confraternity competitions. An evocative panel painting from around 1500, possibly of Netherlandish origin, housed in Dresden, elevates the significance of such arrows. Commemorating a prosperous archer adorned with a patrician neck chain, a gold-linked bracelet, and a gold brooch or badge on his hat, the painting encapsulates the opulence associated with archery. The archer, holding three arrows adorned with peacock feathers, manifests a visual narrative where these ceremonial artifacts assume a prominent role in defining his image. This panel painting aligns with a broader tradition of late medieval Northern European portraits, where individuals of artisanal or bourgeois status are intricately portrayed with the tools of their trade. In this narrative of images, arrows, once instruments of war, metamorphose into ceremonial accoutrements woven into the very fabric of one's finery. Sir Richard's gift of such arrows to Robin, as suggested by the painting, transcends the material. It becomes a symbol, conferring upward mobility and splendor upon Robin, forging a bond of aristocratic largesse between the two figures. In an era where the term yeoman blurred social lines, encompassing diverse roles from potter to page, this narrative unveils the extraordinary social mobility inherent in the ballads, defying the static conventions of medieval social relations. Embarking on a narrative crescendo, this opulent gift crystallizes the zenith of a gentrifying metamorphosis. In Robin Hood and the Potter, serving as the herald of this transformation, we witness the unveiling through ritualistic hand cleansing before meals, Robin's intuitive mastery of courtesy, and his generous bestowals, a resplendent gold ring and a palfrey upon the sheriff's wife. Woven into the narrative fabric of the guest, the dominance of gentility is unmistakable from its inception, where an address extends to an assembly of gentlemen of freeborn blue. Robin, embodying an Arthurian appetite, defers his dining until he witnesses a marvel. Instances furthering this theme include Little John's deployment of the term chawler, twice to describe the ill-behaved monk, a character bereft of courtesy, as asserted by Robin. The narrative delicately captures the nuances of gentility through the ceremonial hand-washing preceding an elaborate repast featuring swan and pheasant. Within the sacred pages of Cambridge University libraries harboring Robin Hood and the Potter, the ostensible custodian was none other than Richard Paul, the Paston's bailiff. His union with a Paston daughter, despite familial opposition, suggests a narrative of interest in ascension and refined etiquette. The manuscript, a literary compendium also housing segments of the Little Children's Little Book, a compendium of courtesies, affirms the proprietor's proclivity 
for the accoutrements of upward social mobility, the early history of the guest remains shrouded in relative obscurity. However, the narrative's significant dedication to Sir Richard at Lee and his financial tribulations hints at the author's conviction. To this storyteller, conduct seems intricately entwined with class, transcending mere lineage or monetary wealth. As the 18th century unfolds, a period marked by the commonplace trajectory of social ascent and descent, even a beloved tale like Robin Hood becomes a mirror reflecting the societal fusion with matter-of-fact clarity. It draws upon the evolving social nuances and the gentrification of archery, illustrating a subtle dance with the changing tides of class dynamics. The ceremonial use of archery in medieval narratives particularly through the emblematic peacock-feathered arrows of Chaucer's squire's yeoman and the legendary Robin Hood, offers a rich lens into the socio-cultural fabric of the time. These symbols, transcending their martial utility, reflect a society deeply engaged with notions of social identity, mobility, and distinction. The opulence of the archer's gear, notably in tales and wills, reveals not just personal pride or leisure, but a broader canvas where status, aspiration, and cultural values intertwine. This exploration into archery's symbolic role underscores the fluidity of medieval social structures and the nuanced interplay between material culture and social stratification. The transition from practical archery equipment to ornamental status symbols encapsulates a shift towards a society that values display and distinction. The narratives of the squires Yeoman and Robin Hood, enriched by their connections to archery, invite further inquiry into how objects can carry complex meanings and mediate social identities. As we peel back the layers of these historical and literary examples, the archer's arrow emerges as a vibrant emblem of change and continuity, challenging us to consider the enduring influence of such symbols in shaping and reflecting societal dynamics. In this rich historical tapestry, the simple bow and arrow become a window into the evolving story of human culture, highlighting the intricate dance of social values, identity, and aspiration across the ages. Well, my merry band of podcast enthusiasts, it's time to bid adieu to the Sherwood shenanigans and wrap up our Robin Hood escapade with a scientific twist that even the Nottingham Sheriff might raise an eyebrow at. Now, as we stroll through the forest of conclusions, Let's ponder the idea that Robin Hood was not just an outlaw with a penchant for green attire, but perhaps an ancient eco-warrior, a nature-loving ninja with a PhD in archery physics. Picture this, Sherwood Forest, as an early version of an environmental protection program, and our hero, Robin, the original tree-hugging hipster. You see, while most see him robbing from the rich to give to the poor, what if he was just rebalancing the forest's carbon credits? Briar Tuck, Little John, and Maid Marian weren't just his entourage, they were the first ever green team, ensuring that the wealth of the forest flowed like a well-regulated ecosystem. And what about the Sheriff of Nottingham, you ask? Well, perhaps he wasn't the villain after all. Maybe he was just a misunderstood environmental regulator, desperately trying to control Sherwood's carbon emissions. Taxing the rich was merely a medieval carbon pricing strategy. Take notes, modern policymakers. But here's the kicker, Robin Hood's archery skills weren't just legendary, they were a physics marvel. His arrows curved through the air like they were auditioning for Cirque du Soleil, defying the laws of projectile motion with each twang of the bowstring. Forget about gravity, Robin had his own gravitational pull. As we bid adieu to our feathered hat-clad friend, let's remember that even in the age of merry men, a bit of humor, a dash of science, and a quiver full of puns, can turn a dark forest into a laugh-filled haven. So, until we meet again in the realms of merry men and green physics, keep your bows straight, your spirits high, and remember, it's not theft if it's for the ecological greater good. This is your mirthful podcaster, signing off with a tip of the hat, a bow to science, and a wink to the whimsy of Sherwood.